Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily with Ray Flowers, Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to use the promo code FSD20 for a 20% discount on the products over at FantasyGuru.com. Welcome to Fantasy Sports Daily. I'm your host, as always, Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here on Fantasy Sports Daily, and that is Ray Flowers. You can find me on the Twitterverse, on Instagram. I have a Threads account. I don't really use that much. I even have a TikTok page that I never use, at the Ray Flowers, the pace to look for all of that information. You can obviously find me over at FantasyGuru.com. You know that now, right? Tell a friend about the podcast. It's free Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time here at Fantasy Sports Daily. Type it into your local podcast network, Fantasy Sports Daily. Uh, we're hooked up with Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Pandora. Are they still doing Google Podcasts anymore? I got to look into that. I don't even know if that feeds anymore, but uh, type us in there. you likely be able to find us. You can obviously watch us here on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Elite Plus Network. And then over at the website, go to the toolbar at the top, Elite Plus. You'll find the show there. Also, I want to thank everyone uh, for all the birthday wishes yesterday. Thank you very much. That was really nice. Appreciate all of that. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments you want to leave, leave them in the chat uh, today here for the show, and we'll try to address those toward the end of the show. Uh, what are we doing today on the show? Well, we're going to talk about some baseball, a little bit of basketball, too. Justin Fensterman is going to join us in about a half hour or so, talk a little bit of hoops. My ho co-host on Elite Sports Game Time, which is Monday through Thursday from 8 to 10 Eastern Time on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. We got through seven innings of the Ronel Blanco no-hitter last night before our show ended. He threw a no-hitter in completion. You probably know that by now, of course. We'll talk a little bit more about Blanco, but Justin will join us in about a half an hour. Uh, before then, you can see we just got a bunch of news and notes here. We'll start out with the Blanco no-hitter in his eighth career start. Yeah, that's kind of rare. Uh, we'll talk about the Dodgers who are changing their pitching rotation already. Uh, then a series of players. Josh Young Young breaks his wrist. Destroy Ruiz gets demoted. Blake Snow. He's got a target date for his return, on and on and on. And you can see that we got a bunch of names. we got veterans, like guys that are killing it, like Mookie Betts, uh, guys like Hancock and Hauk, who had good starts last night. We'll kind of roll through and stream through uh, what occurred last night, basically the last 24 hours, maybe even the last 14 hours if we want to get ah, 12 hours. What the hell? <laughs> the last day, uh, we'll talk about that here. And again, remember, Justin Fenstman joins us in about a half hour. Uh, don't forget to use that promo code FSD20, FSD20. For discounts on the products over at fantasyguru.com. A bunch of links we'll show later in the show. You know, just go to the website and click on the Join Now tab at the top, too. Okay, let's get after it. Uh, Ronel Blanco of the Astros, as I noted. Uh, you can see, oh, I forgot. Jose Altuve in the background there, a little Astros nod. Blanco, in his eighth career start, threw a no-hitter for the Astros last night. Uh, one walk, you know, he was terrific last night. Threw like 105 pitches to get through the nine innings. Uh, and everyone's celebrating that as they well should. It was a it was a dominant effort. He looked terrific. The ball was moving everywhere. Uh, he threw 36 changeups, 34 sliders, 31 fastballs, dropped in four curves. He had 59 swings in the game, including 20 whiffs, half of which came on his changeup. So he had the full repertoire working last night, uh, and it was a great effort. So who is this guy, right? What are we what are we talking about when we say Ronel Blanco? Should we be running to the waiver wire to add him? Should we be getting excited about his fantasy prospects? No one really talked about him in spring. Well, people talked about him, but uh, where are we at? Well, we got to remember right now, you look at the rotation. It's Valdez, Javier, Brown, France, and Blanco for the Astros. We have Lance McCullers coming back at some point this season, right? Maybe Luis Garcia comes back at some point late in the year. Jose Arquiti is supposed to be back in the first half. Justin Verlander is supposed to be back in the first half. And we start running into a scenario where Urquidy and Verlander are the short-term issues for Blanco staying in the rotation. Uh, the team's already basically committed to moving France to the rotation when that opportunity arises. But Urquidy is more likely to start. That's just his, his more he, that's his game, right? You don't have a lot of soft tossers in the bullpen most of the time. Justin Verlander obviously is going to start. So those are two spots likely to change. You're not moving Brown, Javier, or Valdez if they're healthy. So Blanco's going to have a hard time holding on to a starting rotation spot in the long term here. And again, Winter Queedy and Verlander are back. That could be within the month, right? So Blanco could be out of a starting spot in a month. Uh, let's let's talk about who he is and, and why there's some concern about what his role is. There are still scouts out there that believe Blanco is best served in the bullpen, okay? Despite the dominance he showed last night, and everyone wants to get excited about that, um, there are real issues here with control. 
And if you look at his minor league numbers, it's 4.2 walks per nine innings. You look at his major league numbers, it's 4.5 walks per nine innings. He has control issues. He's had control issues for a while now. And before you think, oh, Blanco must be this young kid. Blanco is 30. I left the pause there. He's 30 years old in like seven months. He's 30 plus years old. This is his eighth career start at 30 years of age. He began in the majors as a, well, he began as a professional in North America in 2017. This is not a young guy. Okay. That's something to think about too. It's like, would the Astros, as we saw last night, necessarily hold him back and worry about pitch counts? No. At the same time, he's 30 and he's made eight career starts. That tells you something too. Um, In terms of what he normally gets in terms of the batted ball, he's basically average ground ball, fly ball stuff. Um, but again, he's pre- previously was awful in the seven starts he made before last night. As I noted, many still think that his stuff plays up better in the bullpen because of his control woes. So that's kind of where we're at with him. Uh, short-term pickup, sure. If he, you know, if you have open waiver wires, I'm sure he was grabbed last night and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but this, this is a player in total that can strike guys out. He can definitely be a strikeout in inning arm. He's going to get a few more starts. Let's call it a handful of starts kind of as a guarantee. And then we'll see. Uh, the walks could be an issue. As great as he looked last night, the next time out, it could be the other, you know, the Jekyll and Hyde thing with him. And remember, he is almost 31. He'll be 31 years old this season. So uh, w- tip of the cap, a great effort. Let's not get crazy. Let's not go blow fab budgets. Let's not, you know, let's keep this in check. Because even if he continues to pitch well, as I've noted, the Astros have a lot of reinforcements coming on the starting pitching side of things, which puts Blanco's ability to stay in that rotation, even if he's pitching effectively puts his ability to stay in that rotation in some doubt. Uh, So now let's talk about some of the other issues we got going on here. Um, We were on live on air last night when this happened, and I talked about it. Um, Adoles Garcia and then Josh Young got hit by pitches. And I said it on the the Sirius XM show again. It's Elite Sports Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 Eastern. I'm going to do a little video. I don't know if it'll even work. Um, Yeah, I think it'll work. I hope you can still hear me. Yeah, okay. When, you, when you're a hitter, and they're both right-handed hitters, when the ball comes inside, what do you do? You want to protect your hands. So you turn your shoulder into the pitch, right? You take the ball off your back, okay? So you use your shoulder to protect your hands because the hands are the dangerous part, right? That's what you're supposed to do. That's what they taught me to do when I was seven years old. Major League Baseball players, forget that stuff. They don't need that stuff because they're such great athletes. It's also difficult when the ball's coming 96, all right? I'm, I'm not going to say... But what you do is you turn your front shoulder into the ball to absorb the blow on your shoulder. Both Garcia and Young didn't do that. Both of them, you know, Garcia did the tilt back, right, which left his hands completely exposed and had a ball off his forearm. And then Young actually swung at the pitch. And as he swung at the pitch, he dipped his back arm, his right arm, he dipped it down, and the ball hit him on the wrist. And I said on the broadcast last night, yeesh, you know, that could be something – and right after the game, the Rangers said Young's wrist is fractured. So he's got a broken wrist. We don't know as we record this here at 8 o'clock in the morning on uh, Tuesday what that means long term. But he's going, obviously, to the injured list. You know, depending upon where and how and all that, kind of, there could be surgery involved. We could be looking at three to four weeks. We could easily be looking at four to six weeks. It could be even more significant than that. So this is, you know, this, this is another Josh Young issue. Um, because he's dealt with this. You know, he's had injuries in the past, and that's kind of slowed him down, including last year, right? Uh, Short-term, long-term, whatever it might be, I don't know if the Rangers really make a move, because this is not likely to cost him a season or anything like that, right? So they'll expect to have him back. So Ezekiel Duran probably goes from a guy that's kind of in and out of the lineup to someone who takes over third base consistently. So if Duran is on the waiver wire, that is someone we can have a discussion about. Uh, But this is really just, at the end of the day, really bad news for, for Josh Young. Um, for anyone that's drafted him, you need to make other plans at third base because, again, we don't have the news, but this is going to be a significant issue. Uh, In the case of Ezekiel Duran, he could qualify at multiple positions in your league depending upon the the qualification rules that you have, so that's that's attractive. Uh, He was solid last year, 15 home runs, 8 steals, hitting the 270s, uh, really not much more than a league average offensive guy. But if he's playing daily, like we saw last year, he almost went 15-10, and he hit 276. So, he is, again, someone of note in deeper mixed leagues. That is a great lineup with the Rangers. Obviously, the ballpark is, is a strong place to hit as well. So Duran becomes an attractive addition if you have a need in the infield. Uh, bottom line, though, Josh Young is going to miss some significant time here. Uh, and these Major League Baseball players got to remember their fundamentals. Turn your shoulder into the ball. 
Don't let your hands get hit by a pitch. Also, don't swing at a pitch that you stop swinging at and then get hit by. That's kind of embarrassing. Okay. No, again, I never faced 94 up and in with that with 14 inches of, of run, right? So, <laughs> okay. But um, I, I've told the story previously. I got There was a kid that was pitching at the local high school when I was a senior in high school who ended up going to Stanford on a baseball scholarship. And they had the gun out that day. And he, he I got hit with an 86-mile-an-hour pitch, which is pretty hard. I mean, that's not, you know, but it's pretty hard for a high school kid. And I did it properly. I turned my shoulder into the pitch, took the ball in my side, kind of in my rib cage. It wasn't in my shoulder. It was in my rib cage. Ended up with stitch marks. I had I actually had stitch marks on my side. The ball hit me. It knocked me. It literally knocked me over. It hit me, and I fell over. And there was that one or two seconds of, oh, my God, I'm dead. And then I was like, Okay, I can breathe. I'm all right, right? It turned out it was just a terrible bruise and everything like that. But I had literally had the stitch marks on my side going to senior prom. Now, at senior prom, nothing happened. So no one got a chance to see the stitches. But uh, that was the story with me. Uh, fundamentals are important, kids. Uh, and don't fool around at your senior prom. That, that might be coming up. So don't do that. No. And if you do, use protection. Okay. Uh, Estuary Reeves was demoted. Now, this one is leading to a lot of consternation. And I totally get it here. The athletics are a disaster. Okay, they just are. We all know that. Uh, they don't know where they're going to play after this season. They're, they're they're talking to the city, trying to extend the lease, all this kind of stuff. Estrella Ruiz is someone, and I, I I feel bad about this because I I get the sense from talking to people in Discord and on social media that a lot of people didn't, you know, they they saw a ranking with Estrella Ruiz and they just drafted Estrella Ruiz, either not knowing exactly who he was or with the situation with him. We talked about Ruiz in the preseason. And we talked about the fact that last year, at the end of the year, the athletics were not playing him every day. Strange. Okay. Now, why do you have a you have a guy who leads the league in steals? Is he limited player? Sure. Do you have better options? You're the athletics. No, you don't. If you don't want to play this guy, trade him because there are organizations that would love to have a guy that could steal bases like this. So anyway, there was some concern coming into the season. Well, Ray, why did you have him ranked so high again? Because even as a guy who doesn't play every day, he could still steal 50 plus bases. And I know that the league is different now because guys run more, but 50 steals is 50 steals, man. And, you know, let us let, let me pull up his uh, projections here on uh, fan graphs. Let's see what people had for the steal total for his projections. Uh, the steal total people had, oh, I think it's been adjusted here. Yeah, it's been adjusted. Here. You see, like, 33 steals for Steamer in 77 games. That's 60 steals in the season. You see Zips with them with 50 plus 51 steals in 122 games. So, again... I think those numbers were higher a couple weeks ago. But anyway, the point is that people were still saying, look, this guy's going to steal 50 bases even in a limited role. Those were That's what everyone thought. Well, the Athletics demoted him. And, you know, David Frost says said the following. We saw some at-bats this spring, but the reality is to use his skills, he needs to get on base. He needs to be able to do that on a consistent basis. I'm hoping leading off every day at AAA, it's not a long stay for him down there. Okay. Okay. It's three games. I get it. It's Drew Ruiz in three games had a 375 on base percentage. Like, if you're going to make this move, Athletics, you do this before the season begins. You don't let your guy go out there, have eight plate appearances, get on base three times, still a base, and then demote him. Like, whoa. <laughs> He's never going to be a 375 on base percentage guy, Athletics. That's never going to happen. He was a 375 on base percentage guy in the early going. Look, I mean, and, and it's like, it's one of those things where you're like, just, what are you doing as the athletics organization? This is who Ruiz is. Is it a complete hitter? No. No. And he's never going to be a complete hitter. No one thinks that. But the fact that the A's who have a lack of talent, the A's who have a lack of interest in their organization, have a guy that can motor and steal bases like this, and then they demote him for Tyler Nevin? Who's Tyler Nevin? Great question, listener. Tyler Nevin, the last two years, has a 580 OPS at the big league level. He's played 105 big league games, and he was drafted in 2015. Oh, yeah, that's a real answer. So the Athletics – anyway, I won't belabor this point forever. The bottom line is Lawrence Butler in the short term seems to be the, the beneficiary here, as we've talked about here on this show previously. Butler can be a 15-15 kind of player. We'll see you know, how that turns out. He's got holes in his swing, contact issues, but he's a, he's a nice talent. So I'd love to see him play every day for the Athletics. If they're going to do this, play him. Don't play Tyler Nevin, right? Let's hope they do that. Uh, Ruiz will be back at some point. When is it? I don't know. And uh, this was also the issue with drafting a guy like Ruiz, who was so dependent upon one category, as we said all spring. 
Yes, he's ranked this highly because if he steals 54 bases, that's the value he's going to return in the fantasy space. But if he's hitting 260, but if he's hitting six home runs, but if he's having 42 RBIs, do you want that on your team? So we'll see how this all plays out. This is a disappointing uh, outcome for anyone that drafted Ruiz. Uh, hopefully if you did, you know, you took him late, you didn't reach for him, and it was only for the stolen base play. But even so, again, depending upon guys that have one category of excellence, it's a tough place to be in the fantasy space. Going across the Bay, Blake Snell is going to make his Giants debut against the Nationals on Monday. Uh, he's going to have a simulated game before that point, but next Monday he'll be back in action for the Giants uh, against the Nationals team that he has the ability to dominate completely. We have talked about this again and again. I don't understand why. Uh, organizations, you know, or these players, excuse me, come, they, they sign late and they're not ready to pitch. I don't get that. Blake Snell's back on Monday for the Giants. Against the Nationals, you got to feel good about starting them. So roll them out there. Staying in California, uh, I mean, I don't know what this is all about. Now, I know what this is about, but I don't know what this is all about. I don't know if you saw this. I started writing my cash game breakdown last night, started looking at the pitcher part of things, started writing up Tyler Glass now. Tyler Glass now is set to start for the Dodgers. Then the news comes out last night. The Dodgers are pushing everyone back. They're going Ryan Yarbrough in a, in a bullpen game. It's literally one week into the season. Now, the, the Dodgers played a couple of games in Korea. Fine. Okay. It's one week into the season. One week into the season, the Dodgers, who, as far as we know, have no health issues in their rotation, are going to a bullpen game. Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax must be vomiting. Everyone in the Dodgers rotation is getting pushed back. And this goes back to the discussion we had mostly around Tyler Glass now at the start of the season. But the Dodgers are going to treat all these guys with kid gloves, as they say. No one on the Dodgers throws 180 innings. It doesn't happen. No one on the Dodgers makes 30 starts. It doesn't happen. Look at the last couple of years. It's not what they do. And you can't be more clear about that than going into a freaking bullpen game less than 10 games into the season. This has got to be a concern. Again, I would have never taken Tyler Glasnow where he's being drafted. I thought that was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, and I said it all spring. But taking any of these guys, Miller, Walker Bueller, Yamamoto, any of these guys, the Dodgers aren't going to let them throw 180 innings, are they? Ten Less than 10 days into the start of the season, or 10 games into the start of the season because they played it early, they're going to a bullpen game. Welcome to 2024. Ugh. I could go on for that one for a long time, but I'll just let it go. That's just really disappointing. Really disappointing. Some other news and notes. Uh, Mike Clevenger returned to the White Sox. He signed a free agent contract there. It'll take a while to, to get up to speed. We'll see how long that takes. Not a sexy or exciting signing, of course. An innings eater, AO only play. Yeah, absolutely. Mixed league. We'll wait and see. Matchup base and all that. And again, I'm not clear at this point exactly when he's going to debut. So, we got to work through that a little bit. His teammate, <laughs> his teammate, Ido Jimenez, is day to day with an abductor strain. Byron Buxton, Giancarlo Stanton, Mike Trout, Aaron Judge, Royce Lewis, Ido Jimenez. As we talked, these guys are going to get hurt. And this is now the second issue that Ido Jimenez has had, and it's April 2nd. First one ended up being minor. He missed a day or two and then was back in the lineup. This one might be minor too. Um, kind of doubt it, <laughs> kind of doubt it. Their, their team is hopeful that he won't need to be placed on the injured list. Kind of doubt it. Um, Eloy Jimenez, you know, I can only imagine what it would be like to be an athlete that's like Buxton or Jimenez, these guys, or Lewis, just these phenomenal talents that when they're out there are fantastic. Like everyone knows how good they are. They know how good they are. And to just not be able to do your job because you, your body just continually breaks, it must be so frustrating. But I'm frustrated playing in the fantasy space. I can only imagine what the players are like. But bottom line is Eli Jimenez, uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm not expecting good things in the short term, but hopefully I'm wrong, though history suggests I probably will be right. Another pitcher who recently signed is Jordan Montgomery. He's going to AAA Reno on Sunday. Uh, he threw a 50-pitch bullpen session on Monday. He's going to make that start down in the minors on Sunday. I thought we heard he was up to 75 pitches. So I don't know why he only threw 50 pitches on Monday. I, I don't know. He'll be back in April. We talked about it when he signed with the Diamondbacks. It's like, look, if I'm a Montgomery owner, uh, I'm not expecting much in April. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe by mid-April, he's rocking and rolling. 
Uh, but the good news is he's going to make a start on Monday. They'll see how that goes. I don't know if he'll need multiple starts in the minors. I don't know if the one start will be good enough and that'll be back in the rotation like next weekend uh, for the Diamondbacks. We'll obviously have plenty of time to talk about that. But uh, rounding into shape, I guess, as they say, is Jordan Montgomery. Another Jordan, Jordan Romano, has got a big day today. Now, he's on the injured list with an elbow issue. It's called inflammation. He's obviously on the injured list with Eric Swanson. The, the Jays, excuse me, have said all along the issue is not a significant one with Romano. He should be fine. They don't have any surgical concerns. They don't think there's anything structurally wrong. He's going to throw a bullpen session today, and then we'll see. So this is a big one because if he comes to that clear, maybe he doesn't even make a minor league rehab assignment. I don't know. Maybe they send him down and he's back pitching for the, you know, the Jays on Saturday, right? So this, this could all escalate quickly in a good way with Romano. If he goes out and has any issues, then we got a problem. Then we got a problem. So today is big for Jordan Romano. It's big for the fantasy folks that drafted him, expecting those 30-plus saves, which he could still obviously get to, even missing a week here or two at the start. Uh, and it's also big for the Blue Jays, who are without their top two relievers right now in the pen. Batting order is something we've talked about in articles and on the show here, and I wanted to touch on one guy and how the outlook has changed pretty quickly. Thyro Estrada of the Giants, uh, you know, 10 to 15 home runs, 15 to 20 steals, you know, positional flexibility in some formats, like a nice player, right? Um, nothing ex exciting or sexy, but a lot of that was hitting second for the Giants. In all five games he's played this season, he's hit lower than that. And the fact is he's hit six or lower in every game. So he's gone from the top third to the bottom third. Why? The Giants signed Chapman and Solaire. Moved everyone down the order. You know, Estrada's not a cleanup hitter. He's not a five hitter, so he's down at the bottom. So a guy like Estrada who really needs those plate appearances, unlike a guy like Esther Ruiz who can get one plate appearance and steal the base, a guy like Estrada needs plate appearances because he doesn't do anything in a dynamic fashion. So he is someone now that, and this can always change and injuries and all that, but he's someone now that is trending downward a bit in the fantasy space, Estrada, because we're looking at him, we talk about it all the time, 15 to 20 plate appearances per spot in the lineup over the course of a season. So going from two to seven, five spots, could be up to 100 plate appearances he would lose over the course of the season. That's 75 to 100 plate appearances. If he loses 75 to 100 plate appearances, yuck, right? So again, nothing he's done. He could be the exact same player he was last year or the year before. He's just getting fewer plate appearances with judging his fantasy value. Dylan Carlson's not ready to return yet. Um, in fact, he's not ready to do baseball activities yet with his shoulders. So this is starting to look like a scenario that's going to go a little bit longer than they had anticipated or hoped for. Victor Scott will obviously have more of a chance to establish himself as a big league player with the Cardinals as a result. Uh, Luis Hill came out and, and, you know, I mean, I think last night was a good encapsulation of what the Yankees are expecting from him and what your expectations in the fantasy space should be for him. As we talked about, a lot of people went bananas adding him off waivers. He got the starting spot with the Yankees, and all of a sudden he was the only person anyone could talk about. He throws 98 miles an hour. Yeah, he throws 98 miles an hour. He's going to get a ton of strikeouts. He's going to get a ton of strikeouts. He's got control issues. Okay, we can deal with that. He throws 100 miles an hour. What's the workload like? You and I, you and I had this discussion. What's the workload going to look like? He threw 83 pitches yesterday and got removed. Now, it wasn't 63 pitches. It was 83 pitches. Okay. But he's uh, allowed one hit and one run over four and two third, third innings, and they pulled him out of the game. They didn't even let him throw five innings. He allowed one hit and one run, and they pulled him out at four and two thirds innings. I mean, there's no, there are no innings the last four years on this guy's arm. So that's the Luis Heal experience. And we know how that goes. If you're not able to go at least five innings, you can't get a victory. And then it's a very hollow. You're then trending, slaloming toward Ryan Yarbrough territory just with more strikeouts. But you know what I'm saying? So we'll have to keep an eye on that because that, that was a disappointing first. He wasn't allowed to go to the five innings, get that extra out. Uh, shift, shifting things over to the Mariners and their bullpen. Uh, they've obviously got uh, Gregory Santos and Mr. Bush. On the sidelines, they're anticipating having both those guys back in April. Uh, right now, Ryan Stanek has taken on a more prominent role in the Mariners' bullpen because of the injuries to Santos and Bush. Uh, but the big story yesterday is that Andres Munoz, the guy who was drafted as a top-10 closer in a lot of places, the guy who's been groomed for the closing role, the guy who throws 100 miles an hour, the guy who has dominant stuff but has had some issues staying healthy over the years, one of the rare youngsters that was groomed to be a closer. That usually doesn't happen. Munoz came in when the game was on the line. And when was that? Eighth inning. And this, again, is the problem with saves leagues. It's another issue with saves leagues, folks. Munoz is, without doubt, the most dominant and best pitcher in that bullpen. 
if the Mariners are looking at their team right now and saying, we don't have Santos, we don't have Bush, the game is on the line in our eighth inning, the best pitcher we've got is Munoz, we're going to put Munoz in the eighth inning, he's not getting saved. Ryan Stanek got the ninth inning yesterday. So, you know, we'll have to watch this scenario. Is the Munoz in the eighth inning merely a one-off? Is it because Santos and Bush are unavailable right now? Will that change? Will he become strictly a ninth inning guy when those two return? Is this going to be a mix and match, mix and match scenario? So even if Munoz stays healthy, we have some issues. So that is a situation we'll have to track because that's obviously disappointing when your closer is working in the eighth inning. Uh, if you look at the, the game with the Mets and the Tigers, two strong efforts, Sean Manaya and Reese Olsen uh, basically dueled each other. Uh, five and two-thirds innings for Olsen, six innings for Manaya. I think Olsen was in the breakout pitcher of the year column, if I remember properly. Uh, Manaya was someone that we talked about, and he's intriguing. Now, he wasn't very high in the rankings, and it's it's tough to trust Shamanaya, but he's added velocity this year. He's expanded his pitch mix this year. He's intriguing. So is Olsen, for that matter. Um, you know, there have been questions about how the Tigers were going to operate their rotation, and it wasn't even clear who was going to be in it. Was it going to be Manning, Mize? Would Olsen lose his spot? There was a little bit of that. But I think Olsen is pretty firmly established in that rotation. Not a dominant arm. Not going to be a big strikeout guy. But as he showed last year, he can be very effective. Uh, I think in the case of Manaya, he's a little more intriguing because of his uh, background, because of his pitch mix, because of his ability to miss bats. Uh, but both those guys were really good. Uh, now, the problem is that next time uh, that Manaya pitches, he's going to be facing the, the Reds in Cincinnati, if I'm not mistaken. That is not a good space to pitch. Reese Olsen is going to face the Athletics. That is an excellent place to pitch, as we saw with Tanner Hack last night, though, in the shutout against the Athletics. So Reese Olsen, short term, short, short term, better pickup because he's got the matchup. Manaya might be the better guy long term. But anyway, both of them pitched great yesterday. Ryan Pepiot uh, pitched like butt. He gave up six runs and five and two thirds innings. Um, he, back to back, you know, walks to start the game. And, you know, here we go. And it just, he never caught up. Um, bright future could be as, as soon as this year where he really, you know, delivers. Uh, but the issue with him, just like it was with Manaya, who, I'm, Manaya we just talked about, is that the next start for Pepiot is against the Rockies at Coors Field. So terrible first outing from Pepiot. Next outing that he's lined up for is one of danger. So we're going to have to wait a little bit uh, to get him active and uh, in that lineup in the fantasy space. Let's take a look here at some news and notes before we welcome in Justin Fenstrom and see if anything's popped here in the last few minutes. Uh, the Dodgers selected the contract with Nelson Lamette to help their bullpen out because we know they're not um, convinced of what they're doing in the starting rotation. By the way, James Paxton last night um, blanked the Giants for five innings. Great news. Walked five guys. Not great news. Um, but that was a, it was a decent effort for James Paxton. He's another one of these streaming options in mixed leagues that you can take a look at and think that maybe you can do um, – maybe you can get a little bit of something out of him. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez, who we talked about on the show yesterday – Hit his fourth home run yesterday. He's on fire to start the season here. Um, so that's great news for anyone that rostered him. We talked about the concerns with contact and all that yesterday on the show. Anthony Volpe was four for four. Looks like those swing changes he made are taking hold. And that is something that he really diligently worked on in the offseason. You know, he struggled last year, batting average, struggled last year to get on base, came to camp with a new approach that I'm not going to try to hit 30 home runs. I'm not going to try to hit 25 home runs. I'm going to spray the ball to the field to be a better hitter. And he's off to a great start doing exactly that. Kyle Gibson allowed two runs in seven innings against the Padres. Gibson throws like five or six pitches. He's not an easy at bat. He's not a hard at bat. He's just a, a wily veteran that the Cardinals will hope to do what he did yesterday, which is give him innings effectively. Uh, not sexy or exciting in the fantasy space at, at, at all. But he is obviously someone that I think a lot of us at some point this season are going to add off the waiver wire and say, I need a boost at the starting pitcher spot. Give me Kyle Gibson. Uh, he did that in his first effort yesterday. Okay, use that promo code FSD20, FSD20 for the discount over at fantasyguru.com. Uh, and uh, before we bring in our next gentleman, everyone should know that this gentleman we're bringing in is on Elite Sports Game Time Monday through Thursday from 8 to 10 Eastern on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. That's channel 87. Justin Fenster and myself uh, run that ship for two hours every night, Monday through Thursday, live updates. We're talking hockey. We're talking basketball. We're talking baseball. Lots going on. So we're updating things. We were talking about the hit by pitch last night with, with Young. We were talking about the no-hitter with Blanco. We were talking about the situation on the basketball side of things. And if you want to get involved more directly with the basketball side of things, that Justin helps lead the crew over at FantasyGuru.com. Sign up for the all-in package right now. We dropped the price to $39. 
it's DFS and wagering combined. So you get both packages for one, which if it was just for basketball would be fantastic. But it's not just for basketball. It's also for NHL and PGA and MMA and soccer and racing. All of it, one package, all the articles, all the wagering. Get it. It's the all-in package. Go to fantasyguru.com. Click on the Join Now tab at the top right to get involved there. And if you do that, you won't even, you'll be getting more than just seeing Justin Fensterman on a Tuesday here on the show. You'll be getting Justin Fensterman's work at fantasyguru.com. So we'll welcome in Justin. Uh, Justin, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, appreciate you taking the time on this Tuesday morning. Ray, it's great to see you again. It's been a long time since we last spoke. I hope you had a great night when it came to your birthday. Lobster, how can you go wrong, right? Yeah, we thought we were going for the, the sandwiches and everything like that. We switched it up last minute. There's a, a New England lobster shack. Uh, so I got the lobster roll. We ordered a side lobster. Had a bunch of a flight of little beers. Um, nice. So it was it was, a, it was a pretty good night, Justin. Uh, how are you at cracking? Like that's always, it's a lot of work to get in there when you get crabs and lobster and stuff. Do you mind doing that? Yeah, you know what? I, I don't because it's the rewards are so great. Once you get to the little bones, then it makes it very tough. But the crusher claw, which is the bigger claw, I did right. a report on lobsters in fifth grade. Oh, so nice. I know a lot about this. The okay. crusher claw has the more meat in it than the ripper claw. The right. claw that looks like more like the sh a shredder. Right. That one doesn't have as many, much meat in it. So if you're going to put all your effort in somewhere, you're going for that crusher claw. So I love doing it. But at the same time, Ray, nowadays when you go to a restaurant, it's already kind of pre-cracked. I don't mind not having to put it in the muscle as well. Yeah, you got to pull the little part of the claw, pull it out, and then – Oh, yeah, I got that claw. I think the claw tastes better, too. I'm yeah, a claw dude, I, I live in Maryland, and mm -hmm. everybody eats crabs over there, and mm -hmm. he, I, I don't know how to disassemble the crab. With the lobster, it's a little bit more direct, but there's a certain way you have to do it with the crab right. where one of the bones becomes like a key to unlock <laughs> the stomach. Like, I don't even know how to freaking do it, man. Just give me the meat. Yeah, right? I could barely eat a ham sandwich. I need someone to help me with this all this right. fancy stuff. <laughs> I don't know. My brother. I can brother, barely make peanut butter and jelly. You know. It, do you have peanut butter and jelly, or just peanut butter? Like, if you're making it, do you always do both? Or yes, do you just do yes. Stuff? I am not. There are a lot of people that are very obsessed with peanut butter. My wife, for instance, can have a whole giant spoonful of peanut butter, and that's okay. it. I, I don't find that appetizing. Okay. I just don't. Peanut butter and jelly is awesome. Peanut butter and fluff, pretty good too. My uh, dog loves peanut butter. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that and cheese. The cheese yeah, tax. Cheese always works too. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Uh, so you can see there on the screen, Justin and I, again, Elite Sports Game Time, Monday through Thursday, 8 to 10 Eastern on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. Obviously, we'll be on there tonight talking all things sports. Uh, also part of that package there, as you see it on the screen, the all-in package. And we got to hear, Justin, let's use your expertise in some hoops. And I'm holding the number five up with my hand here because I've heard from you, five is the number of games you thought Joel Embiid was going to play for the Sixers in a return to get ready for the postseason. What are we talking about right now with Joel Embiid? So as of now, Ray, he is not playing in tonight's game at home. I think a lot of people just thought that because the Sixers were still at home, they were going to bring him in back there in Philly. They're about to go on a three-game road trip, so that's looking like where he's going to return. So it's not a lot that he returns the next game, too. By the way, I don't know if I'd bring him back in a very physical matchup against Bam Adebayo, and then a very exhausting matchup from a speed standpoint against Victor Wembanyama. I, I maybe would try to hold him out. I don't want to like disrespect any of the centers in the league, but he's got some hard centers that he's facing. Jaron Jackson Jr., so it's going to be tough for him either way, but I don't know if I'd bring him back versus the Heat. If I'm going to bring him back against anyone, I don't want to bring him back against Bam. So in those games, regardless, Ray, those first few games coming up, I don't see him playing more than 20 minutes in those first few games. They got to see because it's not about how he feels on the court. It's about the recovery afterwards. If his knee swells up, they're going to keep him out for the final few games. At this point, it's just get this guy to the playoffs. So it's about the next day and how his knee reacts from having that physical exhaustion, even playing just probably 20 minutes. On the Elite Sports Game Time show, again, 8 to 10, Monday through Thursday on Sirius XM, we had the injury of Brandon Ingram happen during the show. We talked about it. And, you know, the Pelicans now are in a spot, right? They're kind of in a jam. So what are they doing, you know, with, with the rotation? What are they doing with 
you know, all the production and where do they stand in terms of their playoff aspirations, Jess? Man, it's really going to be hard for them at this point. Ingram's still probably going to be out another few games and you'll see them at some point. The hope is by next week, but they have such a little lead out of the play in tournament. I think they're going to end up there, unfortunately. And we've been talking about teams like Dallas and everything with them streaking. And that's just the unfortunate, sad fact of the situation that as good as this team is defensively, they need a little bit more of that offense. And that's where Brandon Ingram helps. And by the way, Brandon Ingram being out takes them down a small peg defensively. But Ray, I'll say this, the elite mafia has figured this out from a betting standpoint. I got a little too cute last night there, which I didn't even think was getting cute because the Suns allowed a ton of points two point guard. So I really altered down CJ McCollum, but Trey Murphy, he's starting to score more, but his rebounding has been great. Six plus in six straight games. Absolutely outstanding. Also CJ McCollum having the ball in his hands more means that he's going to be given and contributing more assists. That assist number still remains low Ray. So we've tried to figure a way to alt them down and put them together. And we've hit a lot of bets because of this situation. Naturally Zion Williamson is your prioritized player, but I'm noticing in his last few matchups that teams, though they're not having success are trying to double him as much as possible. So I look at CJ McCollum and I see those assists and I'm thinking that, Knowing that, it's going to raise the assist ceiling. A team that wants to raise the roof but is going to have a difficult time doing that is, yeah, woo, woo. Uh, staying here in California is the Sacramento Kings. Uh, Kevin Herter, Malik Monk dealing with injuries. What, what are we, where are we at now with this offense, uh, Justin? This is, we're at that time of year where, you know, realizing who's going to step in, take shots, get playing time can be huge, especially in the DFS space. Where are the Kings at right now? This is another team that has a little bit of a different problem than the Pelicans in that they don't really play defense. And the problem is they need those guys to be hitting shots. Malik Monk, he is your sixth man of the year. In my opinion, he deserves the award, but this team right now is in eighth place. So what does this mean from an offensive standpoint, Ray? Look at the smile on my face ear to ear, because one of your guys it from the past on your Warriors is going to have to come through, and his name is Harrison Barnes. Oh, Harrison different. Barnes, wow. it's his time, and the volatility is going to kill us, Ray, because we're going to put him in our write ups and everything like that, our cheat sheets naturally. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to go two for 11. The next night in a harder matchup, we're going to be like, you know what? Let's kind of stay away from him a little bit. People will be on him. And then what will happen? He'll go eight for nine and he'll make us regret it. So Harrison Barnes and Keegan Murray have just bought themselves a little bit bigger piece of the offensive pie there. Sabonis is still going to do what he does. He's going to do a lot of passing. We know what De'Aaron Fox could do. But those two forwards, Ray, we're going to be looking at them a lot down the stretch when it comes to DFS and even possibly betting Keegan Murray. We've hit a few bets on his points this year, so we're going to be eyeing him watching them. Yeah, looking at Barnes, I just pulled up his stats real quickly here. I mean, he's got his lowest minutes played and average shot per game total since like 2014. Hmm. So, like to your point, he just hasn't been as aggressive. I guess his numbers are similar to last year, but again, it's going down. So, like, he's taking nine shots a game right now on average. Yep. 15, yep. 14, like where if you had to just toss it, I would say he's going to probably bump up to about 12 to 14. They need the floor spacing. I'm also, as I'm kind of thinking about this in my mind, Darren Fox's ceiling overall has to go up now. And this is someone you talk about volatility. He's been one of those guards that's been very up and down lately, though, in the last month, he's been up. And now he gets a little bit of a more secure floor with those other guys out that command the ball, that command shots. So that's why I'm thinking the forwards are going to have to be impactful, Ray, because now if you're any team, you'd be stupid not to have two guys on De'Aaron Fox cut off his lanes because he's a very quick driver, cut off the lane at all costs, make someone else on this team beat you. And if you have to make Sabonis beat you a little bit, okay, Sabonis beats you. Who else is going to beat you? It's got to be those forwards. So Keegan Murray, Harrison Barnes, we're keying in on them. Justin Fenster, you can follow him on social media at Fancy Sports. Uh, joining us here on the show, talking some hoops. Uh, Jalen Johnson is back. What does it mean for the Hawks? Are they a shoe in to make the playoffs? Is this like that much of an impactful move for them? Because I know they can't have DeJounte Murray shooting it 44 times every night. No, they can't. And we actually see that, Ray, that when Jalen Johnson's in, DeJounte Murray recently since Jalen Johnson, before he got hurt, that his production overall went down. And remember, this is with Trey Young out. 
So now it makes me start to not want to pay for him anymore because he's sitting there in DFS at 9,800. And these sites know that, and people are going to be off of him for a couple of games now, and then they're going to bring him down very quickly. So I think overall when you're asking about the playoffs, I don't think the Brooklyn Nets have what it takes at this point. They would have to go on some kind of streak. They're six and a half out. I think the Hawks are going to make it. We know the Bulls have essentially clinched a spot. So the Hawks are right there. I think their magic number might even be one. So they're going to be fine. And it definitely helps them because we just found out on Yeko Konku, their backup center is going to be out for at least another week. So they're getting healthier. But with Jalen Johnson in, usage goes down for a lot of these players. He takes a lot of shots. He hogs the ball. So unless it's a very easy matchup in the post where both him and Clint Capella can eat, it's going to be very hard trusting a lot of these Hawks options the rest of the way, including Johnson as he gets back in the swing of things because the price on him is going to rise quickly. Speaking of the price in the DFS game, basketball is different, I think, than some of these other sports where, you know, there's issues with guys being in the lineup in, you know, December. Once we get toward the end of the season, then we start really dealing with teams falling out of the playoff race, that kind of thing. Are there any teams that were, whoa, let's be really cautious, but throw, we, we plan on building around these guys coming down the stretch here? Are there a few teams that are, are standing out to you with, with some level of concern, Justin? I mean, the Charlotte Hornets, definitely one of those teams. I mean, we've seen them already start ruling out guys for the season. I'm trying to think who else they got. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if all of a sudden <laughs> Brandon Miller gets some kind of cough and doesn't play the last few games. I'm hoping they don't do that. I think the fans that pay for those tickets deserve better. But they're a team that's definitely on my radar. The Memphis Grizzlies as well. They've kind of suffered enough at this point, Ray. I mean, they have no shot at making the playoffs. They've had injury after injury. Jaron Jackson Jr. is a bit prone, so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets ruled out a little bit. So that's something to watch out for. Also, the Spurs, I'm wondering if Wemby is going to be deactivated at really? some point over the last few games. Again, they need league approval for this, and it's going to be hard for them for someone like Wembenyama. I get it's a get a very expensive ticket to go see him. So at this point, I don't think the league is going to be very easy. And this is where the new rules, Ray, mm-hmm. actually will help when it comes to resting players and stuff like that. Well, to me, and again, I'm old school and I'm from a different era and all that, but the idea that – Things got so bad that we now lead lead the league to approve your active roster for a night. To me, sounds amateurish out the wazoo. This is you're these kind (laughs) you're having to force players to be active. Like I again, you're way more into this than me, and you know way more about it than I do. But from the outside, this is preposterous. These guys are getting paid millions of dollars and they can't show for work. Yeah, you're right. And I disagree with them getting to rest or anything like that. When I was growing up in the 90s, no one ever did that. Everybody played. They taped it up. They still continue to play. And that's why I don't like it. But I like that the league is trying to do something to limit this because it happens too much. And as much as I understand it, even as someone who's a content creator, but as a fan, Ray, because the reason why we're in this, you can't spell fantasy without fan is because we love the game so much. And for me, I love seeing these players out there. But I think about, Ray, as someone with a photographic memory, I think about those first few games I went to when I saw the Knicks versus the Jazz in the preseason at Nassau Coliseum, 20 minutes from my house, instead of that schlep into New York City at Penn Station. I got to go see them 20 minutes from my house and see John Stockton and Carl Malone. Those were preseason games, and they were playing full minutes in preseason games. And now... What we're seeing is, yeah, I love that the league, I love that Adam Silver recognizes how BS this is, and he's trying to make something of it. And yeah, there are a few players like LeBron James that can get around it because he's over 35 years old, Ray. There's always got to be a loophole. So there are a few of them here with this. But overall, yeah, it's sad. And I think about little Ray Flowers, who's like a big sports fan and Mm -hmm. loves sports so much, loves nothing else but sports. And All you want to do is see your favorite player. You've been waiting all year Mm because you got the tickets five months ago. You've been waiting all year to see Steph Curry play. And then Steph Curry sits out a game because he's on a back-to-back. It sucks. Yeah, I was thinking, what if little Jennifer uh, had a birthday yesterday like I did, like the Lopez brothers do? What if she shared our birthday and she got tickets to a game two weeks from now to go see? And Webanyama's not playing or whatever. The first time she's going to get a chance to see her hero. Like, it's... You know, 
it, it's just I, I, I struggle because like, we've got the whole Oakland A's thing going on here in the Bay Area, and the fans love the A's, but the ownership doesn't give a crap. And it's a, they it's do, all... they do love the team. It's not all of a sudden like the Sonics fans all of a sudden right. coming out of the woodwork, yeah, right? Yeah. The A's have had actual support. They have, they and they, their fan base isn't huge, but they have a tremendously dedicated fan base, and they do like the fan fest things, and they get like five times as many people going to a fan fest event as they do to the games because the fans are just tired of the ownership. They love the team and the. But I just think about this stuff, and it's like you know, going to an NBA game, depending upon where you where your tickets are, where you you and your you and Jennifer could be going to the game. It could cost you five hundred bucks. Like it's not inexpensive to go to a basketball game. You know, you got to get there, you got to park, you got to you know get a hot dog, or it's five hundred bucks. And to think that you're going to five hundred bucks to watch you know player eleven and twelve on the the team, you know, play the majority. That's a problem. I'm really surprised it's gotten to the point. I'm really surprised it's gotten to this point, Justin. Even though that there are rules and everything that you're talking about. Like, as organizations, how do you do that to your fans? Like, that's the part. At some point, the, the, the fans are going to rebel. At some point, right. it's going to happen. It hasn't yet. But at some point, doesn't it have to happen? I mean, they're, they're greedy, Ray. That's at the end Gosh. of the day. You're, you're the Philadelphia 76ers. You've been building around Joel Embiid for about six, seven years, maybe eight years at this point. This guy's injury prone. You go on runs. He's not fully healthy there. What incentive does the team have in their mind when they're trying to keep whatever – match mashup of talent that they have together you know and trying to make a serious run what incentive do they have to play Joel Embiid I mean you want him to get loose you don't want him going in cold to the playoffs here but come on Ray I mean and at this point we shouldn't have to say that oh we should know that he's probably not going to play towards the end of the season so don't buy tickets to those games well maybe the Sixers should give away those tickets for free or give them heavily discounted hey we know there's a Joel Embiid clause that he might be able to via the league rules because he's probably labeled injury prone where he could get away with taking more off and rest days here. Let's discount the tickets, do something about it to improve the fan experience. Then if we know that there's a risk that if we want to go at the end of the season before the playoffs, then there's a chance of probably 70% chance and beats going to miss the game. It's terrible. Like fanatics used to have, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have like insurance on jerseys. Like if you bought a customized jersey and the guy got traded in 30 days or something, you could swap the jersey. Like, oh, something. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. I actually think that's really cool. Yeah. And I, again, I don't know if they still do that. And they, they can't even make a jersey you can't see through anymore. So I don't know what, <laughs> what, what that's all about. But yeah, they used to have a, it was like, and it was, I don't think it was every jersey, but they would, if you customize, you know, it was one of those things where, yeah, you're spending 200 bucks. If 22 days from now, Bryce Harper gets traded. We'll give you a new jersey. Um, that's kind of nice. And I, I, you know, ultimately the the owners, I think, you know, the, ch the checks just keep coming in. And if you and I and the listeners, if all of us just keep sending the checks in, they're not going to change anything. No, Speak with not, at all. not at all. Not at all. Like you said. Dude, it's the basic laws of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. All right. We're all at the mercy of these leagues because we love sports so much. And a lot has changed. You push someone it gets reviewed for 10 minutes in the league and it's stoppage time. It's you hit a buzzer beater. You can't even celebrate until it's replayed a thousand times. I mean, look, I love sports very much. And again, as someone who's now like a father and everything, and I can't wait to take my daughter to her first sporting events or even any sporting events. Cause I know I'm going to be that dad that, take her with me whenever I can go. You know, I want her to get the best experience. And when I'm building up, hey, we're seeing LeBron James. He's at the final few years of his career and he's sitting out half the games. Yeah, why am I paying that ticket? They know the Lakers are coming to town. They're going to hike up those prices. Mm -hmm. Supply and demand, man. That's at the. It's sad. Justin Fenceman, Ray Flowers here on Fantasy Sports Daily. For more of the sports talk with Justin and I, don't forget to tune into SiriusXM tonight. Lead Sports Game Time is Monday through Thursday from 8 to 10 Eastern. We live follow everything that's going on, whether it's basketball or hockey or college, if that was going on. We were following the, the tournament as well, and obviously baseball at this point of the calendar. So Justin and I will be firing that up at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight, and hope you can join us for that. Thank you for joining us this morning, Justin. Enjoy your day. Keep the passion for tonight. I know you will, and we'll fire it up at 8 o'clock Eastern tonight. Ray, if I could indulge you for a quick minute here. Last time I was on, someone had asked if I can take a shot. Oh, yes, that's true. Or, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's I'm going to do this one time. If something falls and breaks here, I put my bobbleheads there that I don't really – let's just say I don't care as much about okay. on the side. If something breaks, I'm not doing this again. If something doesn't break, I'll take a shot every week. Did you practice? No, I did okay. not practice. Here we go. Okay. Three, two, one, one. two, three. Hey! I hit it! I hit it! I hit it! 
I swear I did not practice that shot. Well, even I if you swear, did, you better caption this, Ray. Wow, I wish I photo. Yeah, well, thanks, yeah. open, Ray. Hey, man, Tuesday. Justin Fensterman, NBA, you need to listen to this guy with what you're doing with your tickets and the discounts and all that because dude just hit it over the back. If you need help with marketing, call Justin Fensterman. He'll hit the shot. That was pretty epic, Justin. Off the, oh, off the backboard, too. Nice touch. Good I'm going to – man, now I'm going to go work for the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Justin. Good shot. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that should be a one-off. Because I know you made it, so I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. That, that was pretty cool, though. That, that was, was really a good. nice moment. It wasn't even Photoshopped or there was no CGI involved. That was real. <laughs> uh, Justin, thanks for your time. I'll talk to you tonight, bud. See you later, Ray. All right, that's Justin Fenceman there for you, folks. What a shot by Justin. Hitting it over the shoulder there. For those of you that can't see it because you're not watching on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Elite Plus Network. We do have a live feed. Justin took the little basket, shot in the mini hoop behind him, over his head. Without looking, probably, I don't know, six, seven feet off the backboard and in. Justin Fensterman is a man who got it done with that. Okay, let's look at some news and notes here. I mean, excuse me, some questions from all of you in the chat room before we disappear. Mark Patterson, or Mark P says, Peterson, excuse me, Mark, Google Podcast is either dead or will be dead this month. Yeah, I remember reading that. I couldn't remember if it was last month or this month. If it's still up, Fantasy Sports Daily is there. If it's obviously defunct, then you have to find something else. Uh, Paul M says, happy belated birthday. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. And again, thank you for all the well wishes. Uh, Eric S, also happy belated. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that. Uh, April 2, actually, today. I don't really know what that is, Mark. Oh, April 2. I guess that's the day the podcast is dead. Well, there you go. So uh, find us on Spotify. Find us on Apple Podcasts. Find us on Pandora. Type in Fantasy Sports Daily. Uh, Matthew A, did you try to tell us you were 20 years old when you started at SiriusXM? I don't think I did. No, yesterday? No, I don't think I did. I was, if I did, I was joking around. I think I said 32 or something and kind of laughed and then went ha ha ha. Clearly, I didn't start at Sirius when I was 20 years old. I did start at Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio the day the channel started. I was there on the first day of the network. Was it 14 years ago, 13 years ago, at the 13 years ago at this point? I was on the first day, but yeah, no, I wasn't 20 years old. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I was uh, having fun with my uh, Mustang Cobra burning out and laying posi traction on the street, though not racing to the point where I got arrested and got in car accidents like Rasheed Rice. But anyway, uh, let's see. Greg Martinez. Ray, I hate these new MLB jerseys. They look cheap. There's been a lot of that. I think they're still working on refining it. Uh, Nike obviously missed the mark. Uh, there's no debate with that. They're, they're see-through. The lettering is small. Some of the lettering was... Uh, not even it was a skew wasn't even done properly in preseason i haven't heard of as many complaints here of late as we were hearing a month ago but yeah there still needs to be some work done there um a andrew m says i'm late but i had to say hi i'll listen back on the app that's right you can listen on youtube youtube.com slash elite plus network at the website go to the elite plus tab at the top and again your podcast form if you want to consume us that way metal arc fence you should have put that on paul yeah pretty much that's what we got and Jordan L, Jason L, excuse me, that was awesome. Yes, that was an awesome shot by Justin Fensterman. Okay, so thanks for listening today. We'll be back tomorrow here on Elite Sports. Oh, excuse me. See, this is what happens when you get all confused. We'll be back tomorrow on Fantasy Sports Daily at 11 o'clock Eastern in the morning. We'll also be back on Elite Sports Game Time tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday uh, is a big day for me. I'm here 8 to or let, let me say East Coast time. Wednesdays I'm here. 11 o'clock Eastern with all of you on Fantasy Sports uh, Daily. Then I go with Jeff Manns on the Elite Sports Show, which is 3 to 6, Monday through Friday on Sirius XM. I'm on with him for three hours for that. Then I do the two hours later with the Elite Sports Game Time from 8 to 10 Eastern. So Wednesdays are my big day. It's six hours of talking. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so if you enjoy Ray Flowers, I guess Wednesday is a big day for you too. If you don't, um, yeah, still listen. I think the information is pretty good. Jeff is great. So is Justin. So at least you've got that going for you. Head over to fantasyguru.com. Use that promo code FSD20. FSD20 for the discounts over at fantasyguru.com. Get the all-in package. Get the football preseason package. Get the DFS and wagering for baseball. Become an MVP member and get it all. Head over to fantasyguru.com and let us help you to win in 2024. I am Ray Flowers, and this has been Fantasy Sports Daily, powered by FantasyGuru.com. Talk to you tomorrow.